Shadow Dragon is definitely one of my favorite games. I have the art book, I have parts for the characters, I've beaten it without resetting on the hardest difficulty. I've probably beaten it in one of the dumbest ways possible by defeating the final boss with Dark Mage Massalon, and I'm the sixth fastest player to ever play the game. With how much I've pushed the game, it's hard to remember how it's actually supposed to be played, which is what brings us to the main point of this video. This Prima Guidebook, approved by Nintendo, used to inform new players on how to overcome this journey. There are guides for the prologue, which means that this guide was meant for the normal difficulty, but that's baby stuff, so I'm gonna put this guide to the test and use its advice on merciless mode. With that said, let's see if the advice from Stefan Stratton, a man who writes guides for Resident Evil and Mario, can guide us to glory. The guide does start off with some good advice, such as keeping Seda alive because she's the key to recruiting several characters, but it all goes downhill quickly once you start talking actual strategy. First off, let's talk about Jagan. The guide uses the classic EXP thief mindset and advises that Jagan gets no kills, meaning that I can't use the Silver Lance to help me take out enemies as quickly as possible. Then there's the advice to buy javelins and use them to chip the pirates until I can finish them off with sword strikes. This meant that the chapter took several attempts to clear since javelin hit rates are so shaky against axe wielding enemies. However, eventually I'm able to make it past the first wave which makes the rest of the map easy. The guide, however, does advise to keep Seda away from the hunter while I maul it, so I move her as far away as possible before taking it out and heading towards the boss. Sadly, the guide doesn't recommend grinding Gordon up to level 20 against his egg, but it does advise us to use deranged attacks to get as much HP as possible. Take a note because this will become a running theme. Chapter 2 is much easier since Augment, his boys, can deal a lot of damage to the pirates of this chapter. However, I would like to note that the guide calls out Kord specifically and calls him the least talented fighter of Agma's men. Rest in peace, Kord Gang. Anyway, I'm able to quickly clear out the top as the guide suggests, and then wait out the remaining enemies. Along the way, we can script Caster into our army, who just wants to pay for his mom's medicine. Luckily, he won't have to worry about anything bad happening to his family while he's gone. Unfortunately, the guide suggests some strangely specific spending, like picking up hand axes for Daros even though he won't be able to hit anything with them and some hammers, even though Bored already has one. This drains my bank account a bit, meaning I won't be able to make the strongest forge I can in Chapter 4. Then the guide suggests to fight the boss with our Cavaliers, which would normally be suicide on Hard 5, but luckily Kane got some lucky speed level ups along the way. Having calves that don't die instantly against Gomer speeds up the fight by quite a bit, and we're quickly able to head on to the next chapter. The guide says to move most of our army up to clash with Navarre's team, even though the narrow path means I won't be able to use a lot of them to fight at once. While this is happening, Marth goes to get the Devil Axe, and after a while, we're able to successfully rescue Lena and Julian. I would like to point out that it doesn't mention the names Warpstaff in her bio or anywhere on this page as far as I can tell, so that doesn't really bode well for the speed of this run. Sadly, I later get into a situation where I have to choose between letting Dragon get a kill or letting Bord die. However, in my heart, I couldn't let that dastardly EXP thief steal my unit's precious points, so with the death of Bord, let's see what the EXP we saved from his death resulted in. After that fantastic level up, Ogma is able to use Navarre's Killing Edge to score crit on the boss which lets Kord easily take him out, which means now it's time for the chapter where we can recruit our Lord and Savior. The guide once again insists on draining my bank account in order to buy a Fire Tome for Merit and two heal staves per healer, because I guess you can never have too much healing. I use whatever scraps I have left to make a wing spear, which is allowed since in one of the first few pages it says to forge strong weapons, and so I call it the Scratinator to honor the man behind the men. The main strategy for this map is choking the bridge so you don't have to take on an assault from two sides. Here's the thing though, it recommends using knights, but on this difficulty, Doga's speed means he gets double and dies very quickly, meaning I have to use my calves to hold everyone off. This once again takes several attempts and it would have just been easier to wipe out the fighters before the horses ever reached me, but oh well. At least it gave me permission to use Jagan to his fullest potential on this map. After that's taken care of, we can finally recruit the best unit in the game, Mathis, and Merrick too I guess. The guide says to take out the armor knight with a hammer, but Bord was the only one with the weapon rank to use it, so I had Merrick use a fire tome to take him out instead. The guide also advises to use the horseman to give a lot of EXP to your unpromoted units, which I gladly take it up on. After that, it once again says to pelt the boss from a distance. The guide also mentions that Mathis can use javelins at base, so I did the only logical thing and grinded Mathis' lance rank up until he could use the rider's bane. And after I was done with that, Marth could make a quick exit. In this chapter, we're advised to have Harden's group choke a point against several archers and cavaliers, even though they're the weakest allies we're ever going to get in this army. I mean, the guide doesn't even have anything to say about Roche or Violin. 
For Mathis had brought up his lance rank, and for Merrick had mentioned his powerful Excalibur, but these dudes are given the most generic descriptions you can imagine. The guide, however, does note that Wolf is the most skilled of this group, which is correct for many reasons you'll see soon. But for now, not even he can hold off these enemies. These goons died so many times that eventually I had to do a tactical retreat that circled around the whole map so they could keep them at bay like the guide wanted. On the Marth side of things, I benched a Jagan so he couldn't steal any more EXP, and were advised to not place anyone within attack range on turn 1, even though Seda could easily melt one of the calves on enemy phase, and also to make it to the Firestone House quickly. So after we grab Wendell and get the Firestone, we can finally unite with Arden's army after their world tour. The guide, however, keeps reminding me that hammers exist every 3 seconds, so I said enough is enough and just had Kord throw hand axes at the boss until he has sea axes so the guide could stop bugging me about it. For this chapter, I decided to reclass Wolf to a general since the guide suggests reclassing units if you're lacking in certain classes, and I don't have a general yet, and he's great for holding off powerful enemies like the Silverlands Cavalier. I was going to show you his amazing general growths from the book once I saw in the glossary that there's a class growths guide, but when I saw it, I realized that this chart is straight up incomprehensible. It uses a combination of letters and numbers, and looking at it gives me a headache. So here's a picture I got off the internet of Wolf's growths. For the chapter itself, once again, it advises us to hold back even though Seda could easily melt that armor net on turn 1 enemy phase. Once I've baited the enemy, it's pretty easy to take them out, especially since Kord can use hammers now. After that, it's easy to pick off the thieves and get the treasure, then have Merrick and Caster play ping pong with the boss. Of course, since the only casualty so far has been Kord, we can't visit the guide in chapter. But luckily, the guide has a solution for this. Sacrificial lambs! However, I actually like having my units be alive, so I think I'll pass on this tip for the rest of the run. I forge a rider's bane at the start of this chapter called the Ba for Bring a Hammer, so I can constantly be reminded of the guide's advice. According to the guide, this chapter has an obvious first move, having Marth waste money on inaccurate steel weapons. The guide also says to bring a lot of bow units, which is actually good advice since the flyers on this map can be a bit overwhelming if you're not prepared. After that, we grab Bantu, who according to this guide is deceptively powerful. Yeah, that's deceptively something, alright. However, the big thing for this chapter is how it recommends dealing with the reinforcements, baiting them out of their zone, one at a time, and frontlining our fighters even though fighters have notoriously bad defense. Even though I could easily have some units advance to block the forts to stop too many of them from spawning in the first place. Oh well, I gotta get that precious EXP. Since this took so long, eventually I lost focus and Abel paid the price for that. I would reset here, but my thought process here was pretty much... Lord Frieza! The f oh. You know that was our last minion, right? Who cares? We have more at home. Luckily, after that, it was reasonably smooth sailing, and after Merrick played another round of ping pong with the boss, I was free to move on. In this chapter, we get Caesar, who the guide says can frequently double enemies, which is true if you're into my particular playstyle, but that doesn't apply to a run like this. And of course, Rad, who... Sure does have four strength. The prep tips for this chapter are interesting since they recommend bringing all three healers, even though that's entirely unneeded, and claims that bringing Seda is a risk because of all the archers, even though she has plenty of space to go to avoid them. I'm easily able to get through the enemy calves quickly because of the Ba and get Roger. However, the chapter isn't done yet since it does advise spawning the reinforcements if you want EXP, and since Wolf is the only one who can reasonably tank all of those guys, I sent him to the forks. The guide also suggests sending my strongest unit to the arena if I'm low on cash, which I am because the guide makes me buy unneeded items. So of course, I send my strongest unit, Mathis, to the arena. Thank god for save points. After some minor hiccups, Mathis is able to get us a large sum of cash to buy things with, and after Wolf's training, he's barely able to catch up with Mathis' strength. After Elena goes on a shopping spree with Mathis' blood money, we're off to Pirate Island. Since this chapter has so many axe enemies, the guide tells us to make good use of the weapon triangle, so I have Mathis, Kane, and Wolf pick up the blade so they can double enemies and dodge more easily. The guide does say to put an armor knight in front of the initial door, but given how my boy Roger fares here, it seems like a better idea to have Kane and Wolf dodge tank, with Kane using the killing edge particularly well. While this is happening, Marth and Seda are going to get George, and for the first time the guide actually suggests a rather interesting strategy. Rather than racing the thief to the Worm Slayer, I can just camp outside with Seda until the thief gets it and then take it from him. I never used Seda like this on this map before, and it's quite efficient. However, since the guide loves getting all the EXP he can get, it advises us to wait through all the waves of reinforcements. Joy! You'd think this guide was written by Riddell by how slowly we're going. 
Luckily, the pirates only have about a 45% hit rate against my three blade boys, so while time consuming, they are eventually weeded out, and Caster earns his mother's health care by slaying the dragon. Since we're back to the mainland and done with the early game, let's take a look and see how our party has evolved since the beginning. The strategies from this guide are getting better by the chapter now since it's actually telling us to move swiftly and use effective weapons to destroy dangerous enemies fast. However, it also says to bring as many armor knights as possible, so I make Wolf a general again and make Caesar a knight, because why not? This is also the first time the warp staff is mentioned. It's slow, but our boy Stefan is learning. Anyway, we quickly kill all the calves and flyers with effective units and warp Caesar to engage with an epic battle against defeat. Let's see how that turns out. Now, the strat for taking out this sniper is to rush him with calves, but that won't work on hard 5 because he's too fast and bulky to be taken out this way, and Wolf and Roger are busy guarding the door. But then I remembered a strat from a few chapters ago. Well, bye Caesar, you should have gotten a better level up. Anyway, with the sniper out of the formation, it's easy to pick him off, grab Minerva, the Master Seal, and the Speed Wings without much issue. I also stock up on door keys in case I need them. The guide orders us to promote a cab first, even though it'd be easier to promote Seda so she can reclass to a paladin to recruit Jake easier, but oh well, it's a math this time, baby. The guide is also a big fan of Minerva, and will suggest we bring her to most chapters after this, and as a Minerva enjoyer myself, I'm grateful. The first few turns go about how you'd expect with baiting the mercs, killing the calves, etc. However, once we get to the main area, there's another interesting strategy I hadn't thought of before. Once you bait the sniper, there's a safe spot where Minerva can fly to activate the aggressive cav AI without being shot down by the ballista. Once the calves and ballista are taken care of, the guide suggests to warp and sated to recruit Jake and tells us to hack up Colson with Minerva. Colson is a bit faster in Hard 5, so she's going to need some help. However, after he's taken care of, it's easy to take the castle. However, the guide suggests more arenaing, so Mathis and Lena get back to their favorite sibling bonding time, Bloodsport. After the quest for more money is done, we move on to the prison break. Now, the first thing to note with this chapter is Dolph's character bio, where it asks the question, his thick armor can stave off the enemy guards, but for how long? About that long, I'd say. Now, the actual strategy for this chapter is probably my favorite in the whole run for how insane it is. I have to warp Marth to the actual prison, then have the prisoners access the convoy to get weapons to break themselves out. Boa is able to make quick work of the first archer with Excalibur, and the rest of the prisoners help in picking off the rest of them the next turn. Now let me tell you, watching Dole, Maslon, and Tomas, often considered some of the worst units in Fire Emblem to break themselves out of prison, is truly one of the most fun experiences I've had with this game. After that, it's your standard affair of beating calves and getting treasure while Wolf blocks the rear. I got two Master Seals and decided to come out Seda and quarter them. Then the game suggests trapping the sniper to get EXP, so I decided to have Dolph take him out because it'd be fun. But then he actually got a level up that defied all logic, securing him a spot on the team. After the Dolph winning, Marth gets a new pair of Jordans and we're on to the worst chapter in the game. Oh, the Ballista chapter, truly the pinnacle of DSFE game design. Usually I'd just have Wolf stomp through this, but that's not how we're playing it this time. So first we lure out the mobile Ballista so we can kill the next turn. While on the bottom, Minerva moves barely outside of the attack range. Once they're lured in, they're quickly disposed of, while Minerva moves into the blind spot. But sadly, she can't take out the Ballista in one round like she can in the guide. Then, in the next turn, we recruit Ashdram and take out the remaining Ballista in the middle row. The enemy phase on this chapter is super dangerous for Midian and Ashdram, and they only survived because of extreme luck, so minus points for that. However, once Midian and Ashdram are safe, it's easier for Wolf, Mathis, and Minerva to take out the remaining Ballista then have Lord Dolph take out the boss. I have to say, after years of playing this map at the turtle's pace, it's nice to get a quick clear, even if it was a bit reliant on one. There's not much to say about the next map, but the guide is just straight up giving good advice now, like having Seda and Minerva take out the initial armor knights and calves on the right so they can pursue the silver card thief, and killing the boss while the other units hold out for reinforcements. I don't know what happened, but I think Minerva's 10 movement might have caused a great awakening in our boys to bomb. This trend continues into the desert chapter, where it's advised to have our flyers quickly pursue the mages and bring a lot of bow units for taking out the wyverns. I reclass Dolphin to a hunter so we can help cast her out on that front. Garneth is a bit of an issue since the guide tells us to have our highest res unit block him, but even when bearded up, Lena doesn't have enough HP to block him. 
so I have her and Wolf alternate. Once Garneth is gone and our flyers have opened to play, we can have Dolk get that sweet Wyvern EXP, have Julian collect the stat boosters, and safely dip. Before proceeding, I tried to make another Rider's Bane called the Cringe Remover, but sadly I ran out of character space so I had to call it the Cringe Remove instead. Sadly, I'm back to questioning the Rider's sanity in this chapter. The beginning of the chapter plays out like how do you'd expect, right? You take out the Wyverns with the bow users, get another human sacrifice from the village, but I realized something when I got to these forts right here. The guy who's been writing this guide the whole time doesn't know about reinforcement blocking. In the paragraph, he recommends leaving a general or knight behind tank for reinforcements. He doesn't even bring up the XP like he usually does. The dude they got to write this guide who doesn't know about one of the most basic elements of Fire Emblem. I honestly don't know if I should blame him or Nintendo here. So whatever, I leave Wolf behind and get another Master Seal. Time to promote Dole! Watch out ladies, this is what peak Shadow Dragon performance looks like. After that, Zane is easily rescued, we use the sacrificial lamb to lure out the calves, Ford smashes the boss's face in, Media grinds on the reinforcements will fail to kill, and Mathis and Lane engage in some of their favorite pastime. In this chapter, the guide insists that you bring the Ballista Boys, which is fair since they're great for taking out the enemies inside the throne room, and that you bring a lot of Dragon Slayers. The guide shows Kane doubling in one round against Dragon, but again, hard five, so he needs a bit of help from Merrick to get the job done. On the other side of the hall, the thieves are in position to get away, so I had to position Dolph in front of the second dragon to prevent this. Luckily, the legend himself is able to one-shot it and stop the thieves from escaping. Things start getting questionable at this point again, as the guide suggests to grind off Morzus and the reinforcements for EXP. My question at this point is, why? A lot of our units are promoted and have good weapon ranks. What good does the EXP of Scrub Knight and Cavs do for our generals and paladins? Keep in mind this guide was written for normal mode, where enemies are painfully easy to take down. You can even solve the whole game with Marth in 30 minutes, so I'm genuinely curious what the author needed this much EXP for. So I get an extra level on Dolph, bought some stuff from the secret shop, and like that, Marth's family has finally been avenged. Since Marth has finally retaken his homeland, this is another good checkpoint to see the current status of the army I'm using. The next chapter is Riders being central, so there's not too much to note here, but the guide does mention the triangle attack once we get S, so I put that to good use to effectively take out the boss. The guide also notes that this is the second to last arena in the game, so you know the drill by now. This chapter is just your standard treasure collecting adventure, with the three spheres being particularly good items, but dear god does it have something messed up in one of its suggestions. It suggests attacking Tiki to gain EXP. Does Lord Stefan know no mercy? even against children, but since I am compelled by the guide, I have Mathis gain a level. Luckily Bantu shows up before this child abuse gets too out of hand. Luckily things get back on track in the Kamis mission with the actually compelling strats. The guide suggests using the Ballista Boys a lot from here on out, so I forge a Thunderbolt called the E because honestly I'm out of forge ideas at this point. On turn 1, the Ballista Boys and the Flyers take out the enemies across the bridge while the Dolph enemy phases the calves. Once that's done, Marth's easily able to grab the hammer in which Lena uses to fix up all of my forges, and while Wolf blocks the bridge, we're forced to confront Camus. The guide suggests using the Ballista to take him out, but he's far too powerful on Hard 5 to be taken out that easily, so I have somebody help them out. The only one who I can think of who's able to get the job done is the least skilled fighter from Talus. Once that epic battle is done, it's easy for Marth and Seda to go recruit Lorenz and end the mission. I'm not going to play 20x, I just wanted to point out that the guide points out that the boss of this chapter has a girly name. That's all. The guide for this chapter suggests waiting for all the reinforcements to spawn before pursuing the boss, because of course it does. It also suggests reclassing to have more bow users, so I have Wolf, Lorenz, and Dolph join Caster in the Horseman Club. Once the reinforcements are eliminated, Gradivus Mathis is able to make quick work of what's left, while Parthia Caster is able to take out any remaining Wyverns. There's also a secret shop where I stock up on stat boosters. Sadly, in this chapter we must part ways with the Star and Light Sphere, because the guide wants us to get the Starlight Tome. It also suggests to bring Zane to impersonate the Ballista Boys. Since I have to ditch the Sphere soon anyway, I have Mathis go apeshit with the Infinite Gradivus on the incoming enemies while the Ballista Boys take out the healers like the guide suggests. Once the rest of the army catches up to Mathis, the remaining enemies are easily cleared out and we're able to make it to the village just in time to save it from the thief. Since the Ballista Boys have nothing else to shoot at, and the guide suggests to 
punish Machilis with ranged attacks. I sniped him out of the sky, and with that, Marth is able to take a seat on his new sky throne. Now it's time to see if we can win against Garneth. Our highest res unit is still Lena, so I have her snort all the coke I've acquired throughout the game to make the Garneth fight as smooth as possible. This is once again a chapter where the guide suggests heavy ballista usage, and I can see why considering how annoying the enemy swarm users are. It also offers another good tip using the Earth Sphere to see which Garneth is real. Once the real Garneth is spotted, I have Lena go over to him, gear water up, and take him out. Now Marth finally has a sword that'll deal 25% damage to the final boss before he's one-rounded in return. After that, the chapter is pretty much one big training session, so I reclassed Kane into a Swordmaster to see if I could get him some speed level ups. With that, let's get to one of the most tedious levels in Shadow Dragon. I I'm just gonna be blunt here. The guide just straight up says to warp skip this one. I'm not lying. Look, right here, it says it in the book. I guess even the best of us can get tired of Shadow Dragon's late game. So I forged a Dragon's Bane called the Warp Staff, have Est Triangle attack the boss, and hit up the Omstaff in Secret Shop before I dip. Finally, there's Endgame. The guide says there are multiple ways to organize your units this chapter, but speed is essential. So before recording this, I spent an hour finding the best way to go about this, considering the guide's step-by-step -step guide won't account for R5 Endgame enemies. With that said, Here's the party I'm bringing after I've appropriately distributed the stat boosters I got from the secret shops. Now let's get into it. First I have Marth and Tiki use the Earth Spear twice in a row to weaken most of the enemies on the map so my units can actually take them out. Then have Caster, Cord, and Seda take out the enemies on the right, while Mathis, Wendell, and Midia take out the enemies on the left. While the Blista Boys are using the E to take out the enemy Ballisticians. On turn 2 I pick off any stragglers and have the Blista Boys take out a pesky Thoron Sage while Dolph guards them. On turn 3, the units from the top are breathing down our necks, so I warp over Mathis to the right side to support Seda and Caster to take out the remaining enemies on the right, while Kane uses the Forged Rider's Bane to take out the Gravesword Paladins coming from the left. As a side note, I guess the author finally learned about reinforcement blocking here, since he actually recommends it, so I have non-essential units like Wolf stay behind to block the reinforcements. Finally, it's onto the throne room. I do what the guide suggests and have the Ballista Boys take out the healers and do damage to the snipers. Unfortunately, due to a positional error, Mathis the Great and Powerful dies. Luckily, he quickly gets over it thanks to the Omstaff. At this point, the southern reinforcements are approaching too quickly and I've yet to make significant progress in the throne room. So, I suicide Kane into a dragon so I'll mark and kill it. And sadly, Beck and Lena are killed on the next enemy phase. Another hero spawns, and to take him out, I have to put forward in Medius' attack range, which results in an instant KO for the most skilled fighter from Talos. But due to a sacrifice, we're finally at Medius. The guide suggests using Tiki to defeat him, however, that doesn't go over well. Caster is the next to fall, but don't worry, I'm sure they don't have medical bills in heaven. And after all that, there's only one thing to do. To avenge the death of Lena, and himself I suppose, Mathis makes the final strike. And with that, Medius is once again defeated by humans. Well, it was bloody, but hey, at least that's how Nintendo intended it to be. I honestly don't know how to feel about this guide. It's filled with a bunch of common Fire Emblem mistakes, like Jagans being EXP thieves, and that could mislead new players that would bought this guide. But at the same time, it also has amazing strats like the Prison Break. Overall though, I'd say I liked it quite a bit. The way it's organized is charming, and you can really tell the author had a lot of fun writing this with lines like the Camus Conundrum. And at the end of the day, you have to admit that I was still able to beat the hardest mode in this game with this guide, and that's pretty impressive considering it was written for the base difficulty. I genuinely appreciate every page of passion that went into this, and I hope after this video, you too can see that maybe every once in a while, it's worth going back to the basics. Hey guys, it's a post-video unscripted 5 points here. Sorry I haven't uploaded in two weeks, but I was obviously making this. Uh which took a long time since I had to play a 20 hour game that condense it into like a 25 minute scripted video. I don't usually do this, but if you could like, like this video and comment, I usually don't say crap like that, but like I just spent two weeks making this and I would like the video to do well and like the algorithm and for people to see it. So if you could do that for me, that'd be great. Thanks for watching it by the way, again, it took me two weeks, my most ambitious video yet. So thanks if you're watching this scene that obviously means you watched the full video. And for the love of God, vote for Mathis and choose your legends around six.